This time on episode 283 of Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D., we discuss Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 6, Episode 2, Window of Opportunity, Weekly Marvel News, and your feedback. I'm Ryan from the Dad.io Podcast, a show dedicated to dorky dads everywhere. Part of the Gonna Geek Network, just like the show you're checking out now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other dadalicious geeky shows at gonnageeknetwork.com. You have been granted clearance by director Alfonso Mac McKenzie. Stand by for a shield debriefing. All information to be discussed here is classified and may only be discussed among agents granted clearance by the S.H.I.E.L.D. director. Now it's time for your scheduled debriefing. I'm Director SP. I'm Agent Lauren. And I'm Agent Michelle. Welcome to Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. We're a Marvel Comic Universe fan show. This show is recorded on Monday, May 20th, 2019, live from the Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. studios and broadcast galactic-wide via www.geeks.live. Come on and join our live chat as we record. Ladies, happy National Rescue Dog Day. Yay, Aww. rescue dogs. My friend's dogs are res- My friend, yeah, my friend's dogs are all rescue dogs. Every pet I've had has been a rescue. Yeah, say well, no, my dog Chiquita we got from a newspaper ad. But other than that, all my pets have been rescues. I'm puppy sitting my son's dog for the next week, and that is a rescue dog. Rescue dogs are the best dogs. They are. They're so grateful. Yeah. I've actually got one in the house right now. All right. So now that we've shared our love of dogs, we're going to move on with the show. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a fan based podcast on the ABC television show Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yay, it's back. The Marvel, the multiple Marvel small screen series. And the Marvel Cinematic and Comic Book Universes in general. Because now you're thinking with portals. If you'd like to talk to us about playing with portals, you can visit our website, legendsofshield.com. You can call us at our voicemail, 844-THE-BUS-1. That's 844-843-2871. You can find us on Facebook, Legends of Shield Podcast. You can get a hold of us on Twitter at Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. You can find us on YouTube, www.youtube.com slash gunnageek. You can tell your Amazon device to enable Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. skill. You can join our Discord server chat at gunnageek.com slash Discord. And remember, Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is a proud member of the gunnageek.com network. We have a little change up for you today. Apparently, we had some technical difficulties yesterday when Lauren and Haley were supposed to record. Lauren is able to join us today. So is Michelle and me. I wasn't going to be here, but I am here now. So you have Agent Michelle, Agent Lauren and myself and Agent Haley had to work right now. So she is out, but she will be back next week. Lauren, was there really a technical problem that would have been better solved had Fitz been on Earth? (laughs) Um, Yeah, if the guy can fix all of the spaceship problems that he did, he can fix a computer that has trouble booting up. So we really need to get Fitz back so that Agent Haley's computer is good to go for next week. Meantime, we're going to get on with the main event. We're going to be talking about the second Episode of the sixth season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Window of Opportunity. We already went through the cast of season six last time, so we'll spare you that. But we do have it in our show notes. If we have to refer to it, Window of Opportunity is the title of the episode. (laughs) It aired on Friday, May 17, 2019. Michelle, who directed the episode? This episode was directed by Kevin Tankeron, has 26 directing credits starting in 2008, including 18 Mortal Kombat Legacy, one Supergirl, one Iron Fist, two Legends of Tomorrow, one Inhumans, one Arrow, 
3 The Flash, and 13 of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Lauren, who were the writers for this episode? This episode was written by a team. First off, we have James C. Oliver. If that name sounds familiar to you, it's because uh, he's been on the show a lot. He has three writing credits since 20... Oh, I thought I had it up here. Three writing credits since 2015, starting with one Under the Dome, two episodes of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Slingshot, and 22 of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as story editor, and five as just a writer. Also written by Sharla Oliver, who has four writing credits starting in 2015, with one Under the Dome, five of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Double Agent, two of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Slingshot, and 22 of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. as story editor, and six as writer. The webisodes were so neat that they were both a part of, and I'm kind of hoping to get some webisodes like this fall as we're waiting for the next season, season seven of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to start. Don't know if we'll get it or not, but it'd be kind of neat if we did. Yeah, I don't think we are. Be nice, but I'm not counting on it. Yeah. So, window of opportunity, we start every episode by usually asking Haley, and she's not here right now, what the title means. Ooh, ooh, I got it, I got it. And, okay, so Lauren, what does the title mean? It's a reference to one of the best Stargate SG-1 episodes ever. It is. I was going to mention that. So, I'm a big Stargate SG-1 fan, obviously, Stargate Pioneer. Oh, obviously. You don't say, you don't say Stargate Pioneer. You like Stargate. When I saw the title pop up, I was like, oh, I know this one, and so did Lauren, so we were both in on it. Also, I might add, as a homeowner, I would really like the ability to create windows as quickly as Sarge did with a electric drill that has been converted into a paint gun. That would be, that would be really cool. It would, it would indeed. So yes, window of opportunity to Michelle, what does it mean in relation to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D.? I think it's the team trying to find that opportunity to get Sarge and his Fury Road crew. And then Fitz is looking for an opportunity to not only survive, but to also save the crew. He inadvertently put in danger and right at the end it seems as though Gemma is trying to create that opportunity of of finding fit we'll find out next week I guess if if it's one of those they arrive and oh no he's gone it's so convenient or if they're actually going to get a reunion yeah we actually saw the ships cross in the night that was pretty neat how they gave us that CGI visualization for it, I also want to point out the window of opportunity was the window that they created in between the, I forget what it's called, but whatever the semi is called, we'll just call it. Uh, oh, um, they had a name for it and now I'm blanking out. I know. I want to go with the Knight Rider name. Oh, no, they were calling it. Scott and I were joking about it, how they went from the bus to like the tanker, something like that. Yeah, okay. I, I was going to go with Goliath because that's the evil truck in Knight Rider. So, uh, either way, I'll call it Goliath. You guys can call it whatever you want. But yes, the tanker, that seems to work as well. Anyway, so you had the window of opportunity going back and forth between. Also, if we want to be just completely literal about it, yeah, those portals that they're making, those are windows. The airlock, that is a window of sorts yeah, window to space. question mark yeah the window that fits is looking at those space slugs through the little Ew, sea slugs we'll talk about those later Ew. i think they're cute i think they're not i don't think that's a one-off i think we're gonna get space slugs in the future because they're still on board the ship so oh well, yeah but we'll talk about it we'll get there yeah we'll get okay there. okay so yes, lots of opportunities with Windows, aptly named, and a good homage to Stargate. I don't know if they did that or not on purpose, but I'm going to say they did. So showrunners, thank you very much for the little tip of the hat to Stargate. There was a lot of action in this episode, and I particularly like that May, May is just, oh, she's beat up, but she keeps on giving as good as she's getting. Uh, she gets tripped up, literally and figuratively. 
and she ends up losing and she mentions that she loses, but she did great inside the tanker, didn't she? Oh my God. Yes, it was. I mean, she got, she got rid of that one guy kind of fairly easy. And then the big guy comes in and she has that, that stance. It's almost kind of like Neo in the matrix where, you know, he does that little like come here move, but she doesn't do that. But she's just standing there like, I'm not afraid of you and I'll take you. And she does. She gets that butterfly chick as well. She really only has that pause when Sarge comes in with the whole, is that Coulson? Is it a clone? Is it some sort of time remnant? I have no idea, but we learned that the DNA is the same somehow. But it was a really good fight. There was a mention that, who was it? Jack Pax, Pax uh, said, that there is a past life, whoever you were in your past life. So I have to believe this is actually some version of Coulson that has been reanimated again. And mind you, he did not want to be reanimated. We had this whole discussion a year and a half ago, and he is now doing whatever he's, I mean, he's there for a purpose. I just don't know what the purpose is. Remember, the DNA was spliced with other things. As well, it wasn't just Coulson's DNA, it was all alien stuff as well. And it is him, though. So we have not seen the body, we did not see the death scene. I don't think we do. And May keeps on saying, I was with him until the end, but there was, I think there's, they're leading up to there's something that happened after that. And I don't know if May knew about it or not, but obviously, I think this is Coulson Prime reanimated. I really hope that's not the case. Because that's the first time I, it took me a while to sort of buy it after him getting, you know, stabbed through the heart by Loki. I really would rather it be some sort of weird clone time remnant because they have messed with time. He's been in the future. I don't really want it to be Coulson Prime from the dead again. Well, Brooke Williams keeps on bringing back, you can come back a butterfly, and they keep on telling her not everybody comes back as a butterfly. So I think this is some sort of, what do you call it? It's not reanimation. Uh, when you are resurrected into another body or another animal or whatever. What is that called? Reincarnation. Re reincarnation, yeah. So I think it's something like that. And I, I think that Brooke, by, by the way, Brooke Williams... In the credits, in the IMDb credits last episode, she was known as Butterfly, but everybody calls her Snow or Snowflake now. So I'm not really sure what her character's name is. It's Snow. It's Snowflake. Okay. We have uh, Jocko, Snowflake, Sarge, and... Pax. It's Pax. Yeah, Pax. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so you have those... And the crew, as Coulson's calling it, my crew. And Coulson, by the way, he's doing his best Terminator uh, impression with getting the shotgun and, and the cool sunglasses, which are not the same sunglasses as Agent Coulson. He looks at those and he get, he just passes them by, goes up the stack and gets another set of sunglasses. So you get the sense that even if this is a reincarnated Phil Coulson, that it's just not the same person. Yeah, I really, really liked that visual clue. The whole, oh, is he going to pick the sunglasses or is this going to be our clue that somehow there's some hint of our Phil Coulson here? And no, he went for something very not Phil Coulson. I think we got our first real scene with Dr. Benson as he is trying to piece things together that the team already knows. We already know as an audience, but the general public and anybody that has not been part of S.H.I.E.L.D., they just don't know about it. So he's going over all the past, like LMDs, and they're like, oh, no, we don't want to do that again. And it's a possibility until you rule it out, right? Well, LMDs don't have DNA, so that rules that one out. So Dr. Benson is doing a good job of trying to piece things together. And ultimately, I don't mind him taking a drink at the end of this one after what he discovers. Yeah, no matter what they do, I wonder if they go from world to world destroying them for some reason. I wonder who they work for or the independent contractors. I know Colson was talking about how this Earth 
not only, I guess, we have everything, but it's a better atmosphere. I don't think, okay, we saw that clip at the end where we see it looks like a world's being destroyed. I don't think they're destroying it. I think they're escaping them. Are they? I mean, he's got the gun. Colson has the gun and he's about to light it up. I either in a test or whatever. I thought he was testing it. I thought they were testing because they were trying to see, hey, are these crystals working? Oh my God. I love that so much where they're trying to see, oh, okay, we need these things. We need these things. Hey, here's some sparkly things. And of course, uh, the things that we consider, I love that trope where it's something that we consider so valuable and somebody else who's, you know, higher tech than us or whatever is like, this is worthless. What are you doing? Our money is worthless to them. Our, our gems and jewelry are worthless to them. What are they valuing because it powers their tech? Those crystals that you get at the new agey, you know, BS store at the mall. Piezoelectric gems, which I will repeat what was said on the show, which is actually correct. Crystals that are naturally polarized and can generate an electric charge under applied mechanical pressure. So you crush them and they generate a charge and that's how they work. So it's an energy source. And if you have something that can collect that energy appropriately, you can get a big discharge basically for them and power something like a weapon or maybe a portal to the next world or something like that. I don't know if they are good or bad. I don't know if they're following around just going world to world surviving or if they're the cause of this or whatever. But I get a sense where they're leading us is that Coulson's actually going to team up with our shield agents at the end of the season, right? And they're going to try to stop this destruction. I That's just the sense that I get in what's going on. I don't know. Am I off base? I don't know. I think that's just a little too telegraphed. I think that's wishful thinking. I actually do want this Sarge maybe to be a bad guy. I mean, it's been painful for me to just see him. I want something interesting. I was thinking about that where Bill Colson is played by Clark Gregg is actually doing a decent job at a bad guy. You know, his cool, calm demeanor when he is an Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. or if he's director or whatever, can work as a bad guy. He's not really changing too much of his acting ability. And it's just, it's the same Coulson. And I never really thought of him in terms of a bad guy, really, until this season. And we're getting it. And so I can see him acting the same way, both characters. So he's actually doing a good job. Clark Gregg's doing a good job. He's really good at being threatening while being really calm. He's reminding me a little bit of, you know, the Iron Man Coulson that we saw, where he's just kind of flat, like Iron Man, like MCU Coulson that we were seeing. But he's more seasoned than that, though. Yeah, but uh, that kind of flat affectation kind of. But then, you know, he lets out these hints of uh, menace almost like when he's talking to. The jewelry store, the clerk, jewelry store clerk, yeah. sales woman. Yeah. Yeah. It's saying stuff like, OK, you're, you're getting a sense that uh, you're getting a little excited about the potential sale and your heart rate's going up and stuff like that. And then, oh, by the way, we're just going to kill your security guards and. You know, don't be a hero, which Michelle. You have something to say about Colson's hero statement. I noticed that he repeated a phrase, and I have to admit, it does make me think of when people would say, how was Tahiti? He would automatically say, it's a magical place. He says it at the shop, and he says it at the jewelry store about, it's moments like these that you want to be a hero, but in the end, most people aren't. I know I'm paraphrasing, but it's that basically the same sentence. And that, that kind of creeped me out. I might go and, oh my goodness, is this his, it's a magical place? Yeah, Sarge's, it's a magical place versus Agent Coulson. Yeah, it could be. I'm wondering if somebody told him that once or if that was somebody who trained him used that once or... 
Well, the interesting thing again is at the end, May is confronting Phil and he call and she calls him Colson. Again, it's not the first time, it's the second time. And he apparently froze. I don't remember him freezing, and I watched it twice, so go figure. But he was talking to Jacko in Goliath afterwards. See, I use Goliath again. There's a callback, Goliath. That's truck. You guys want to call it tanker? That's fine. I'm calling it Goliath. Anyway, he's talking to Jacko in Goliath, and Jacko's really concerned about his boss at this point. What? Well, why'd you freeze? And what is that term, Colson? Because they don't know it's a name. And he's like, I don't know, but it rings a bell. So it's interesting. It's if it is Phil Colson reincarnated, he is actually have some sort of a recollection of Colson the name. Doesn't know what it is yet, but it's there. So I think they're linked somehow. You know, I'm actually fine with Coles. I was actually fine with Colson being dead at the end of last season. I would have watched the show. Even without Clark Gregg. I love you, Clark Gregg. I do. And you're a great director. I would have been fine with him just being behind the camera and no version of Coulson at all. And that's what we were all prepared for until we started seeing some of the trailers. That said, I do want to find out what the connection between them is. And I look forward to that. The other thing that happened in this episode was we get to ride along, basically, with Mr. Fitz and Enoch as they are trying to survive aboard the vessel and Fitz has to get a little creative. So we were all worried last episode that he was going to be this drugged out, jacked up guy. And no, we find out that it's the real Fitz. Michelle, how relieved were you that we didn't have a transformed Fitz? Oh, you mean about how I was right and that he was doing it to blend in with wherever he was? Yeah, I was good with that. I was just hoping that he hadn't had a brain, a further brain injury because they'd already gone down that path. Like if his stasis pod had forced him to be, you know, in a low atmosphere situation or something like that, as he was being reanimated, I was just hoping that we weren't going to get another brain damage. And we did. So that was good. And not only that, but he thinks creatively about putting in some safeguards for his situation that ultimately turned out right. Lauren, what did you think about his uh, little trick that he pulled on the captain? What do you call it? The Commodore, the commander, the commander, the controller, <laughs> the controller. Oh, it's typical smart fits. Just again, always good at thinking on his feet. By the way, something interesting about the controller I thought he kind of looked naggingly familiar and looked it up, him up. So while he's not Spartacus, Spartacus Blood and Sand cast, in 2004, there was a USA made-for-TV movie version of Spartacus, and he played the character of Gannicus in that. Oh. So he was a Spartacus cast member, but not our Spartacus cast. Again, with the Spartacus connection. Can't get away. All right. Well, the other thing that I want to point out about this ship, which I don't even remember what the name of this thing is, is the snails, which ultimately gives Fitz away, but they're still there. And I think we're going to at least see them until then or refer, have them referred as cargo next episode. I don't think you can just get rid of the snails, although, I mean, they do from time to time, just get rid of stuff, but this could be something that comes back. Yeah. Enoch said that. It looked like, because at first Fitz was like, oh, hey, I increased the efficiency so the snails should breed better. And then at the end, Enoch's like, I think this isn't going to be so good on the snails. And Fitz is like, I can live with that. What a trick, though, to rig either another airlock or the cargo door to open instead of the airlock. <laughs> And Fitz knows that you're thinking Fitz is going to sacrifice himself and he just gets into the airlock. And it's a smart move, right? It's a smart move because it could prove he could end up saving everybody and he could work with the controller or what happens is he was safe and the controller got blown out. So although judging by where they were, I wouldn't put it past the controller wiping the front windshield of. Zephyr 
Oh, he's going to be the fly. You know, kind of like in the, the Thor Ragnarok, where Thor bumped up against the Milano. Sure. I thought it was interesting that Fitz admitted he, he knows what hateful men can do. That nice sort of callback to when he was in the framework. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Because he, he personally knows. Well done. Yeah. What's going on with Deke, Michelle? Well, he's still missing in action, roaming around, probably looking for Zima and Lemons. <laughs> We're going to come back and Zeke's going to have all these souvenirs from like Disney World and Six Flags. And he's going to be obsessed with like the weirdest things possible. Yeah, they're not going to be the nice little figurines. It's going to be like the weird plastic things that you think has no meaning, but he just finds absolutely cool. It's going to be that weird knick-knacky stuff. So let's rate director Mac for the episode. Let's just do scale one to 10. Michelle, how do you think he did? Well, he's still sort of in that I'm the director. I'm collecting information. I'm telling people what to do. It's only the second episode. We really don't know what he's been like over the past few months. I mean, he knows how to delegate. He, I think he's pretty sure that Yo-Yo and Keller are together and he's not making a big deal about it. At least not that we could see. A solid seven. Okay, solid seven. I mean, he diffused the confrontation between May and Benson. So, yeah. Lauren, what do you think? Scale one to ten, Director Mac. Yeah, about seven or eight. Yeah, like we said, he's really good at delegating. Good leadership is, what, nine-tenths being good at delegating? He's still got a level head, somehow, improbably. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how he is after all of this, but right. so far, he seems to be doing pretty good. I'll, I'll take a half a notch down. I'll go six and a half because he has pleaded that he was he's stated that he's going to be transparent with dr benson but there's just a lot of information which is not being communicated right away and he's off to the next thing and maybe it's just that he's forgetting that dr benson doesn't know everything or maybe it's because he's trying to be compartmental anyway I, i'll give him six and a half and we'll hopefully he'll bring dr benson up to speed a little bit more in the future well that's a lot to bring up the speed i mean it's like Oh yeah, we did this and and then it was that and then it was this. That's a lot. It is, but in the course of the conversation, they just moved on right away and they need to bring him up with relevant stuff in an efficient manner. So I think Matt can do a better job at that in the future and Dr. Benson's going to be going through the archives and he's going to become more knowledgeable as as time progresses anyway, so we'll just see how that relationship progresses. True. Sure. Anything else, Michelle? I really like the shopping part at the beginning. Again, it's so very Terminator-esque. I really like how uh, the big guy got a brain freeze. <laughs> that they like the sugar water. That's what they called it. They call it sugar water. I need sugar. I mean, that's true. That really is all that it is. I just thought that yep. was a really cool way of introducing, you know, our team, the bad guys again. Learn anything from the episode? Um, the preview next week where they're on the casino planet looks fun. I love me a good casino planet. Yep. And I love uh, Pax calling out, not everyone gets to come back as butterflies. And everybody's a butterfly. Yep. It was a good episode. I enjoyed it. It's hard to go wrong. A lot of setup in this episode as I'm reviewing it. Not a ton of stuff happened, but it was just jam-packed for the hour. Next time we'll be going over Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Season 6, Episode 3, which is entitled Fear and Loathing on the Planet of Kitson. And we will see the casino planet. And we will catch up with our Zephyr 1 crew as they passed in the night. Ships in the night, as it were with Fitz's ship as well.
We have a few news items this week. We're going to start with the Loki TV series. Yep. So we've discussed, if you've listened to our Avengers Endgame episode, that uh, Loki's antics in that movie, yes, Loki shows up, for those who haven't seen it yet. Spoiler. So Loki, when he teleports away with the Time Stone, would create his own timeline, says Joe Russo. It gets very complicated, but it would be but it would be impossible for Cap to rectify the timeline unless he found Loki. The minute Loki does something as dramatic as take the space stone, he's created a branch reality. So they've apparently there's an idea that hey, maybe Captain America's chasing Loki around. They've mentioned that, you know, it's been kicked around that the Loki TV show is him jumping around through history, screwing up history. So I guess maybe at the end, Captain America shows up, puts the handcuffs on him, takes him back to that scene. I, when I first saw this title, I was thinking in terms of Loki becomes Captain America. You know, that's what I thought, but you know, I, I can get this. I, I could see Captain America coming in and slapping the cuffs on and stuff. It, it's the only way to end it, right? I mean, there's many ways they could end it, but that's the one that's canon compliant. I mean, the ones where they, they make out that one is fanfic compliant, but not necessarily canon compliant. Well, speaking of another favorite fanfic duo, <laughs> um, Sebastian Stan discusses Falcon and the Winter Soldier. There was a Comic Con in Italy, I guess this weekend, last weekend. And Sebastian Stan talked a lot there. In this particular Mary Sue article, it's mostly about uh, what we could see from the show. None of this is actually canon yet, since as far as I know, the show hasn't actually been, none of the scripts are finalized. But he said that he wants to explore Bucky's life outside of superhero stuff, like, hey, maybe Bucky goes on a date, gets a phone, whatever. and. The series is also going to be our first time seeing Sam Cap, so that's going to be fun. I get the sense that the days of the Marvel snipers are getting fewer and fewer between, and that it's okay for some of these actors to go out and actually talk about stuff, if it's speculation especially, but I don't think they're going to clamp down too much on them unless it's another big event. Then, you know, you start to do the things like you don't give Tob Holland the entire script and you, I don't know, uh, film fake scenes with Mark Ruffalo, you know, those sorts of things. But I, I think right now the floor is open for everybody to talk. Well, also, this is um, advertisement for Disney Plus. That's where all these shows are supposed to be. So having your actors them getting permission yeah go ahead and talk about all this stuff get people interested in these shows so they will subscribe moving on to movie news james gunn finally breaks his silence there's an article on deadline.com where james gunn talks about his firing and then rehiring by disney and his reaction to both the firing and people supporting him and all of this stuff. And he's mentioned a lot of stuff about it. First of all, that he, fully, he says fully that he is responsible for the offensive tweets from years and years and years ago that were the ones dragged out by the alt-right and says, yeah, I, I did this to myself and I am mad at myself for it. He says, I don't blame anyone. I feel and have felt bad for a while about some of the ways I spoke publicly, some of the jokes I made, some of the targets of my humor, just the unintentional consequences about not being more compassionate in what I'm putting out there. Disney totally had the right to fire me. This isn't a free speech, speech issue. I said something they didn't like, and they completely had the right to fire me. And then he said that there was this outpouring of love for him. And he said that he had a lot of anger at himself. 
and that he landed Suicide Squad. When he landed Suicide Squad, he said, technically, my fears were allayed immediately. Jason Bloom from Bloom House was doing a Comic-Con panel when the announcement happened and said, I'd hire James Gunn right now. And he mentions that, you know, he tried to handle it like he imagines you would handle a divorce. Like, well, I don't want to look on all this time that I spent as a completely bad thing. We had a lot of good times, but it's just like, okay, what can I do to mitigate this? And then with, someone said, given another lease with Guardians, what characters or themes are you most excited to see through in the third film? And he responded, when you asked me what was saddest for me when I thought it was gone, and to anybody, and anybody at Marvel can tell you, it's this very strange and attached relationship to Rocket. Rocket is me. He really is, even if that sounds narcissistic. Groot is like my dog. <laughs> and of course, you dance like your dog. <laughs> so it's, it's a really good interview. I really recommend reading it. I like that he's taking responsibility. I like that he is actually verbalizing that he is blaming himself, although I'm not sure how healthy that is long term. At some point, you got to let go with it. But I can understand. I mean, we've all done things that we regret in life and we go, man, I w really wish I wouldn't have done that later on. And this was one of those things for him. So I'm glad he's getting it out because it's just something that's human and it he's not blaming Disney either. He's like, they're totally in their right. And he was taking that road with the free speech issue. So I'm, I'm glad he's still uh, on the, the road here. My spouse and I have had long talks about, uh, especially in the wake of the James Gunn initial firing. When people say something like, Oh, I'm sorry you were offended, or you can tell it's just something written up by publicity, like the PR team, that's, that's not an apology. So I'm sorry you were offended is not an apology. I'm sorry I got caught is not an apology. I understand that I messed up and I take full responsibility for this. I am going to try to do better. I have tried to do better. I am showing you how I am doing better. That's an apology. Words without actions are toothless. Words with actions, not toothless. James Gunn has, in the past long time, actually tried to put you know, his actions where his mouth are and tried to be a better person, and I respect that. Exactly, me too, and he is just really talented, so I'm glad that Disney decided to bring him back and continue on with the Guardians of the Galaxy franchise, at least for one more, and... Honestly, this is growing on me. You guys know that I really hate the Suicide Squad after the last movie, at least in the current DC franchise. And, you know, if, if there's anybody that could turn it around, James Gunn is one of those people that could probably turn it around and be a little, at least entertaining for me. So I, I'm really looking forward to his future works because he's proven to me that he is talented. They might cast Michael Rooker as King Shark. I'm willing to give Suicide Squad 2 a shot. <laughs> Rooker. Ah, Rooker. Rooker and Sean Gunn on another panel. I hope Sean Gunn's somewhere in the Suicide Squad 2. Oh, he will be. So more about Sebastian Stan and talking at that Italian Comic Con. The Mary Sue has a couple of articles about this, but they never say what the con's actually called. It's just an Italian comic convention. It's at presumably that same panel where he talked about Falcon and Winter Soldier. But he let it slip that the upcoming solo Black Widow movie would take place after the events of Captain America's Civil War. It's still a rumor. Take this with a huge grain of salt. So remember, speculation so far, remember all those um, Hydra super soldiers and tanks that we saw frozen? In Civil War, the, the secret Siberian Hydra base. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Would it have something to do with that? Would it have something to do with, I don't know. Who knows? We won't know until it, we get more actual news not leaked out by, you know, somebody at a con. We'll find out. I could see that my thought was that it was going to be a period piece like way back. And my, my gut reaction was 
I just don't want to see that de-aging throughout the film on Scarlett Johansson. And that was a worry of mine, to be honest. But if they do this, th- this is completely believable. I, I could live with that. Not that they couldn't pull the other one off, but honestly, all the de-aging that they've done so far, it's getting better, but it's just not there yet. I mean, I think we've seen that. We saw it in the last movie, right? When they went to New Jersey. And that's it for the news. Here we go. Well, we love interacting with you, and we got some feedback on Twitter. We heard from at Adana Girl. Adana Girl has some issues with uh, a plot point in Avengers Endgame. Three reasons: there's no way Steve could have been Peggy's husband's all Peggy's husband all along, and the father of her kids in her photos in Winter Soldier. Are we supposed to believe Steve would have sat on America's ass, knowing the following things were happening? There's this whole tweet thread about all the things that were going on throughout all the movies. I responded to that. I saw that, yeah. And I said, there is nothing that said that Steve in that timeline did not interject himself. They could have saved uh, or solved a lot of the mysteries along the way with Hydra and and Thanos. Specifically. Knowing Hydra was infiltrating SSR slash S.H.I.E.L.D. and doing nothing, knowing Bucky was alive and where he was doing and doing nothing, knowing Bucky was ordered to kill Howard and Maria Stark and doing nothing. So the thing is, uh, there is a very, very notorious plot thing. You probably know the word. I'm, my, my head's all over the place right now. That happened during World War II, where using, I think it was Enigma, they were able to decode a a German attack that was happening. Yeah, so the Enigma... Okay, so there was two code-breaking things that happened during World War II. One was in the Japanese theater of... Or the Pacific Theater of Operation, where we got the Japanese code, and we were able to determine that they were going to attack Midway. And then in the Europe area of responsibility, there was a code... That was broken. I mean, we were stealing code machines galore, but there was a specific submarine or U-boat that we... That was it. Yeah, got a code machine off, and then we were able to decipher a lot of their messages. So that was a big factor of intelligence behind World War II. Specifically, they were able to uncover this one... This one attack that was happening on, I think, British soil, or this... They had to... They were... they had to let it happen because otherwise it would have leaked that they had broken this code. And it's, it's a really famous intelligence case in World War II and one that Steve absolutely would have been familiar with, both as somebody who fought in the European theater in World War II and from somebody whose totally not girlfriend was an intelligence officer. Well, it depends on when he went, if he went back after that fact, which I think he did, then he wouldn't have been able to interfere with World War II. No, I'm saying he would have been familiar with that specific example of... Oh, I see. Just letting it go. Knowing something has to happen for the greater good. And and that's what I was going to point out. Like, I don't see him sitting on his hands and just letting Hydra take over or just letting Thanos happen. But if you interfere with those, you cause all sorts of new stuff that might be worse than what actually happened, although that's hard to imagine with Hydra and Thanos. This is a huge theme in a lot of time travel fiction and hell fanfic that I read is I want to fix a thing, but by trying to fix it, am I breaking it worse? And the person who is usually trying to fix it, usually, especially in the fanfic that I read, it's somebody going back in time trying to prevent a thing from happening, trying to fix a thing that happened. After a point, it's like, okay, well, you broke it. Now you don't know what happens. How can you fix something when you don't know what happens? And a lot of the time it ends up significantly worse. There's a, um, 
a really famous quote from a J.R.R. Tolkien short story where this one character is talking to another and tells him, could have been different, couldn't have been better. It could have been different, but it couldn't have been better. And I think that's something you need to take into account in any sort of time travel thing. And you heard it here first. Make sure you stock up on your time travel knowledge before it happens to you and get everything that Lauren is teaching you because you're going to need it someday. Well, that's it for the feedback this week. We appreciate everybody that has actually reached out to us over the last couple of weeks. It's been a really busy month with everything going on in Marvel and we're covering it all in Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. So thank you very much. In the meantime, Michelle, you had a, a suggestion on how we actually move out of this podcast. Yeah, I think we should airlock this one out. <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening. I hope you've enjoyed the outtakes that I've been putting in the podcast lately. I know a lot of people have been listening and downloading the show. So just let me know if you like those or not, and we will continue them as best I can. Thank you to everybody who interacts with us. Um, I'm sorry I wasn't able to live tweet this past week. Uh, there have been some things that have come up that have uh, that. Yeah, there's been some things that have come up. It's fine, though. So um, thank you again so much. And we love you guys. Yes, thank you to everyone who listens. We appreciate it. You know, join us over. I'm the one active on Discord. So if you want to have interesting conversations over there, that's me, Lauren's Twitter. But no matter how you interact with us, we really appreciate it. We certainly do. And I'm over on the Discord server, too. But... I'll let Michelle take lead. She get, you get a lot of great stories. So until next time, I'm Director SP. I'm Agent Lauren. And I'm Agent Michelle. See you next time. Bye. 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 Thank you for listening. If you want to leave us feedback, go to gunageek.com and you will find all our contact information and other shows. You can also visit legendsofshield.com where you'll find our complete archive of podcasts. The music heard on this podcast is by Kevin McLeod, found at incompetech.com and also artists on pond5.com and audiojungle.net. The opinions heard on this podcast are those of the individual hosts and do not represent Stargate Pioneer Productions, Legends of Shield, or Gunna Geek. Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. is the property of the Disney Corporation, Marvel Studios, and ABC. No infringement is intended. Legends of S.H.I.E.L.D. is copyright 2013 through 2019.